Okay, I think we'll get started on time to try to uh, give our speaker as much time as possible. So first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody to the first uh, <clears throat> Freedom Biomedical Research Institute Pioneers in Biomedical Research Seminar of the series. This is our, I don't know, maybe eighth or ninth year of doing this or so. So for those of us who have been around here a while, it's kind of routine. For new students, it's new, and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Uh, I'm not going to introduce today's speaker. I just want to introduce the program first and just say uh, I hope everybody will put these on your calendar. They're 11 a.m. on Fridays, almost every Friday. I think there are a couple we don't have them that conflict with some big national meetings or holidays. I think we're not having one on Christmas Day this year, so you can take that off your calendar. Uh, but it's really a great series, uh, lots of good speakers, and I'm sure you all enjoy it. So um, I look forward to seeing you all here. There is food. There's a rule. You have to come to the seminar to get the food. Anybody seen running away with food not attending the seminar will be hunted down. Uh, and we will, we will find you somewhere and get our bag of potato chips back. Anyway, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the introducer uh, for today's speaker, um, Dr. Shannon Ferris, who knows the work very closely of uh, today's speaker, Dr. Michael Sutton, will tell us a little bit about our speaker today. So, Shannon, welcome. So it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mike Sutton this afternoon. Uh, Mike is originally from Canada, uh, where he received his bachelor's degree in psychology at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Uh, and as we learned uh, at dinner last night, during his undergrad, Mike was a very eager undergrad um, and wanted to work with uh, Richard Benninger. Uh, and with his persistence, he eventually weared him down um, and was able to join his lab, where he worked uh, on the pharmacology of dopamine receptors and reward. Uh, then Mike moved on to do his PhD uh, in neuroscience at Yale University with Tom Carew, um, where he was working on the molecular mechanisms underlying different phases of plasticity uh, in the California sea slug, Aplysia, uh, after which he did his postdoctoral training with Aaron Schumann at Caltech. Um, and that's where I really became aware uh, of Mike's work, which was really creative um, and working on the role of local translation in dendrites. Uh, and in particular, he discovered something that really expanded the knowledge um, of the field and how we think about local translation and how it can impact both pre- and post-synaptic um, mechanisms. Uh, and specifically, he showed that dendritically localized and synthesized BDNF uh, can retrogradely signal um, to the presynapt and affect neurotransmitter release, which is something that really hadn't even been considered uh, in that field yet. Um, and so. Uh, he also has one of what I believed is the most widely cited review in local translation uh, in 2006 from his time with Aaron Schumann. Uh, and I actually briefly went over it again last night uh, and was really amazed and humbled with the fact that he was able to propose some of these ideas that we are still critically working on today. So um, Mike's had an incredibly productive career um, from his undergrad to his current lab, which is now at the University of Michigan where he was recruited to after his postdoc. He's now associate professor in the Department of Molecular and Integrative Physiology. He's won a number of awards uh, and honors, including being recognized as a 2008 Pew Scholar. He's trained dozens of trainees, uh, including, I think it's 45 undergraduates, uh, as I counted. Uh, and such, he's won two awards for excellence in teaching. Um, and so with that, Mike, thanks for accepting our, our uh, invitation to come tell us about your current work. Looking forward to it. Well, thank you very much, Shannon. Uh, thank you, Michael uh, and Michael, for the invitation. I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, Shannon, that was a lovely introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, it uh, I'm delighted to be here. It's a tremendous honor to kick off uh, the Frontiers and uh, the Pioneers in Biomedical Research Lecture Series. Um, I uh, hope I set a reasonably high bar. <laughs> um, so I've had a wonderful visit so far. Uh, we had a great dinner last night, uh, uh, talked about a lot of stories. We had uh, uh, wonderful one-on-one -on -one meetings today with Michael, Sharon, and uh, Shannon, uh, talked some great science. So I'm very excited about this place. It's really a, a, a wonderful environment. Um, so I'm very glad that I could be here. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a bit about the work in my lab today. And my lab has uh, a, a, few, um, a few major interests. We focus most of our studies uh, uh, around the mammalian hippocampus, and we're particularly interested in, in synaptic connections. How do these connections form during development? What, uh, how are they refined during particular patterns of activity during critical periods? And once these synapses have formed, what types of mechanisms contribute to their plasticity? Um, uh, over the years, we've had uh, a particular interest, as Shannon mentioned, in local protein translation in dendrites. 
Uh, when I started in this field, the idea was sort of heretical. It has now sort of moved to mainstream. Um, but still, there's a lot of work to be done. Shannon's doing a lot of very beautiful work now looking at local translation in Area CA2. I'm going to talk more generally about some of the functional roles that local translation might play in regulating synaptic function and, and some interesting new data that we have on that. Um, okay, so, uh, so without further ado, let me sort of uh, set the context here. So I'm going to talk today about a story uh, 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 about local translational control in dendrites and how that might um, interact with um, functional plasticity, not only in the dendritic compartment, the postsynaptic compartment, but also in the presynaptic compartment. And just to sort of put this whole sort of idea into context, if we, uh, if we think that of a neuron as basically a very simple form, it has three basic compartments. It has a cell body, uh, it has a dendritic compartment here, and it has an axon. And I'm sorry, folks, that the, the images don't get any more sophisticated than this during the talk. Okay, so this very simplified view Right? And, we, and of course, these, these different compartments have very specialized functions. Dendrites are important for receiving information, generally speaking, axons for transmitting it. And of course, all of these different processes require unique complements of proteins. Um, but when we think about you know, how these different uh, compartments operate, and we think about the surface area, the relative surface area, here is the cell body drawn to scale. The dendrites would occupy this level of surface area, whereas the axons would occupy this level. So the axons have an enormous sort of area that needs specialized function and likely needs specialized mechanisms for regulation of gene expression. Okay? Um, so uh, we think about overall proteostasis in neurons, we think of two basic mechanisms. One is the regulated translation of, of, of gene products, and the others are targeted degradation. Of course, these two uh, processes are like yin and yang. They're, they have to be coordinated in order to precisely regulate the uh, proteomes that in different compartments, either the synaptic proteome or the overall cellular proteome. Okay, so we're going to talk today about an intersection of, of, of stories where local translation is actually coordinated with local protein degradation, but in a very unique way. So um, if we look at it, and I tried to pick a, a, a cartoon, a neuron here that's sort of as closely matched the cartoon as possible. So, um, so here's actually a picture of a hippocampal neuron in culture. It's expressing uh, fluorescent proteins, so you can. Uh, look at all of its various processes. Um, and these neurons receive many, many synapses, many thousands of synapses along their dendritic arbors. A typical hippocampal uh, CA1 foramen neuron receives about 30,000 uh, synaptic connections. Many of these come from unique presynaptic partners. Okay, so if we zoom in on any one of these synapses, um, uh, you'll notice that in addition to having, here's the, the, the presynaptic terminal, here's the postsynaptic spine associated with it, and what was noticed very early on by Ozzy Stewart and colleagues, this is in fact a picture that eff effectively changed my life, um, was that there was protein synthetic machinery located at these synaptic sites. And not only was that machinery present, but it appeared to be actively translating proteins. That is, you see these polyribosome complexes in EM micrographs, uh, which is a signature of actively translating ribosomes. This suggested that each of these synapses might be uh, regulating translation of its own proteome, proteome, proteome dynamically in response to various patterns of activity. Now, uh, another unique feature of these synaptic connections, and one that uh, we often forget about, is there is precise functional alignment between the postsynaptic element here and the presynaptic domain, right? So the postsynaptic element has specialized structures like the postsynaptic density, but so does the presynaptic terminal. It has active zones. Um, and these are generally very precisely aligned with the, with the postsynaptic uh, machinery. So what's interesting is that many different postsynaptic structures, even neighboring postsynaptic structures, can differ markedly in their size and their functional properties. But despite that, their presynaptic partners tend to be very tightly matched. Okay? So there have to be mechanisms, especially hundreds of microns away from the cell body, that maintain this functional alignment, this functional coordination between pre- and post-synaptic elements, but we really know nothing about them, okay? And I think I'm gonna, what we're excited about with part of the story that I'm gonna talk about today is that we think that this is one mechanism that actually contributes to this sort of functional stabilization of pre- and post-synaptic domains and allows them to maintain tight coordination of function despite ongoing changes um, in either compartment, okay? So my lab has traditionally studied uh, mechanisms controlling translation. I'm going to focus today exclusively on one pathway called the mTOR, uh, mTOR signaling pathway. So mTOR is a serine threonine protein kinase. Um, it's known, best known for its role um, in 
functioning in one of two complexes, what we call mTOR complex two, which is involved in cytoskeletal remodeling, and mTOR complex one, which is involved in translational control, particularly at the level of initiation, and in non-neuronal cells plays an important role in controlling cell growth and metabolism. In neuronal cells, um, uh, those functions are probably less important, and instead mTOR seems to play a more, more focused role on controlling neuroplasticity. Um, so mTOR is a, 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 a sort of hot target for various neurodevelopmental disorders. Several gene mutations in this pathway lead to, to uh, various neurodevelopmental disorders that all are all associated with intellectual disability, autism, and generally very, very severe seizures. Um, and this is a picture from about 10 years ago of what we understood about mTOR's role in controlling synaptic plasticity. This is from a review, a very nice review by uh, Ray Kelleher and Mark Fair. And it sort of illustrates sort of the way we thought about it 10 years ago, which is that there, we had some idea of the, the signaling pathways that linked activity or growth factor receptor signaling with mTOR activation in, in, at synapses. And we had a general idea of what mTOR was doing uh, in that it seemed to play a major role in, con in controlling the abundance of postsynaptic glutamate receptors at synaptic sites. And there's nothing that I'm going to say today that's going to change that view. In fact, we've done lots of work that's largely confirmed this sort of worldview of mTOR. We know that it plays a very important role in controlling the function of the postsynaptic compartment um, by virtue of this signaling pathway. Um, uh, however, I'm going to tell you a, about a, a sort of novel role for mTOR that we're very interested about, and that is uh, mTOR is playing, and we think that mTOR is playing a very important role not only in controlling the postsynaptic compartment, but also its functional alignment with the presynaptic element that it happens to synapse with. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I should say that, that despite this sort of worldview being uh, uh, largely agreed upon, what was odd is that these various uh, uh, mouse models or animal models of neurodevelopmental disorders associated with mTOR dysregulation of mTOR signaling, the so-called mTORopathies, as Pete Crino would call it, um, uh, that there was remarkable diversity in the synaptic phenotypes that were observed. So in some cases, you saw changes in postsynaptic function, some cases overall neural excitability, some cases presynaptic neurotransmitter release, and even, uh, uh, even from the same lab studying the same uh, mouse model, at different neurodevelopmental stages, you could see different effects emerge. So this sort of very, uh, this sort of clouded our understanding of exactly what mTOR is doing to regulate overall neural excitability. And so um, we decided that, that, or we reasoned that perhaps this is because mTOR uh, signaling, when it's dysregulated, causes a constellation of, of changes that evolve over time. And, and a good way to figure, start figuring things out is to figure out what happens first. Okay? And this was the idea that led Trace Henry, a former graduate student in my lab, to do almost a ridiculously simple experiment at this point. Okay? He took cultures of hippocampal neurons, networks of neurons. He used low efficiency transfection strategies to, to, uh, uh, to express this uh, GTPA is called REB, which is an upstream activator of mTOR complex one signaling, uh, well referred to as TORC1 signaling. Okay? And so here are the transfected neuron. Okay? And when we look at this transfected neuron, we see that mTOR signaling is upregulated by virtue of this downstream effector phosphorylated protein S6. So we know that mTOR signaling has been upregulated in a cell autonomous way. And about roughly five neurons out of about 50,000, so extremely low copy number, um, we see that it's this uh, increase in mTOR signaling. Um, and what we were expecting to see, in fact, um, this is why we sort of did the experiment, was we were expecting to see differences in receptor abundance at synaptic sites. And we thought that this would be reflected in the amplitude of synaptic currents that we measured. Okay, so these are, measure, these are miniature excitatory postsynaptic currents that we measure from these cells. And generally, changes in receptor abundance tend to lead to, to changes in um, miniature amplitude, uh, which we can measure very, very sensitively. But to our surprise, we saw no such changes. In fact, the postsynaptic functions seemed to be largely unaffected. Uh, and more to our surprise, what changed instead was this presynaptic parameter, this frequency of these miniature synaptic currents. Okay? They increased about two to three fold, um, despite the fact um, that these reflect spontaneous release events from terminals that are not actually targeted by the mTOR C1 manipulation. So this suggests that when we express, when we activate mTOR in the postsynaptic neuron, we see changes not in that neuron, but in fact in all the presynaptic neurons that synapse onto it. Okay, and we confirm this using optical approaches. This is using uh, V-glute fluorid imaging. So we're imaging um, synaptic vesicle release based on the uh, dequenching of 
uh, acidic version, uh, a pH sensitive version of GFP called fluorin. Okay, and so when we drive activity, we see we can uh, monitor synaptic vesicle exocytosis under control conditions or under conditions where mTOR has been widely activated using RebQ64L expression. And again, we see large increases in synaptic vesicle release, uh, uh, confirming that these effects on miniature frequency, in fact, reflect changes in presynaptic neurotransmitter release. Okay. Um, so what's different about these neurons that express uh, where mTOR has been activated? Well, there's lots of things, of course, but one of the most striking differences we noticed was an expression of the neurotrophin BDNF. Okay, so uh, BDNF is an important uh, neurotrophin. It's released from dendrites. It plays a very important role in controlling plasticity. I won't get into all the nuances of what it does, but what Trace observed was that when we, when we activated mTOR, um, we saw a striking increase in BDNF expression in the dendritic compartment but surprisingly, no real changes in the somatic compartment. Okay, so this is the quantification here. You see about a two-fold increase in BDNF expression in the dendrites, but changes, but MAP2, which is a co-labeled, doesn't, doesn't change. It's sort of internal negative control. But somatic expression of BDNF doesn't change at all. So this is very surprising to us um, that you'd see such compartment-specific changes in BDNF expression, but it turns out to be actually a theme that I'll return to later in the talk. So, does this big increase in dendritic beating up, does that actually contribute to this transsynaptic signaling that mTOR uh, seems to play a role in? And in fact, it does, because if we do the same experiment where we express RebQ64L, and we include a track BFC, this is basically a FC portion of an antibody fused to the ligand binding domain of, of track B, acts essentially as a BDNF chelator, um, binding, binding up BDNF extracellularly, you can see that this completely blocks the um, increase in presynaptic function we get with postsynaptic mTOR activation. This suggests that BDNF must be, in fact, released from this postsynaptic cell, which is uh, 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 an interpretation that we've confirmed using a variety of other approaches, including uh, selective knockdown uh, in the postsynaptic compartment. Okay, so this leads to a very, very simple model where postsynaptic mTOR C1 signaling, in addition to regulating the postsynaptic compartment, which again, we, we think that it does, um, although activation isn't sufficient to do so, that it also plays an important role in controlling presynaptic release through a sort of transsynaptic signaling pathway, where BDNF is the critical signal that gets released from the postsynaptic neuron and acts on the presynaptic terminal. Yes, Mike. Um, maybe you're going to get to this, and Trace won't worry about it, but do you have any evidence to suggest that the retrograde transsynaptic action of BDNF in some response uh, where expression occurred to the presynaptic terminal RNA versus affecting neighboring presynaptic terminal? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And so I would say uh, yes and no. So we can't get down to the level that you suggest, which is at the level of the individual spine. Uh, we've instead, however, gotten down at the, the level of a few spines. So we use local microperfusion approaches. And if we locally perfuse track BFC, for example, um, we can basically block this transsynaptic signaling, block the increases in presynaptic function in a very localized region of dendrite. So the, the, the caveat there is that this isn't a single synapse, this is about 10 synapses or so. Um, but, we, but it definitely happens on a local level. I'm not gonna talk about a lot of that data, but I think that's actually a very good question. Okay. Um, okay, so, um, so we see these changes. Uh, is this something that is pathological? Is this something that really only comes with continued um, uh, overactivation of mTOR C1 signaling, or is this something that actually might underlie some of mTOR signaling effects, okay? So to really get at this question, we have to get at timing. How quickly do these changes emerge when we activate mTOR signaling? So we took advantage of a, a, of a lipid messenger called phosphatidic acid, who, where Lee Chen's lab originally showed that this could drive mTOR signaling in non-neuronal cells. Um, <clears throat> and we took advantage of this as a way to sort of acutely activate mTOR signaling. It binds directly to mTOR and can drive its activation um, which is something that we confirmed just in some uh, rudimentary experiments. So we apply phosphatidic acid. We see increases in mTOR signaling based on phospho S6 expression. Um, and this allowed us to ask, do these changes associated with mTOR signaling, do they emerge quickly, um, or do they take several hours to, to show up? And the answer is they emerge very quickly. So when we activate mTOR signaling, just keep your uh, attention here, we see an increase in presynaptic function that emerges within about 45 minutes, well, sooner in fact, but it's, it's basically there as soon as we look, um, continues to grow, and this is blocked by, the, by, by what you'd expect. It's blocked by protein synthesis inhibitors and esomycin, blocked by track BFC, and it's blocked by rapamycin, which is an mTOR C1 specific inhibitor. 
Um, okay, so these changes emerge quickly, and these changes also emerge in, in, in native synapses, in synapses that we know define synapses in their native context. So here in acute hippocampal slices, we've been, we looked at, at changes in uh, release probability from CA3 neurons onto CA1 neurons, a CA3, CA1 synapse. And here we're using paired pulse facilitation as sort of a measure. Paired pulse facilitation is inversely related to release probability. So that increases in release probability are associated with decreases in paired pulse facilitation. There's actually a very strong literature on this. I won't get into this, but we can talk about it at the end of the talk if you'd like. Um, and when we activate mTOR C1 signaling, we see a striking decrease in, in paired pulse facilitation, as you'd expect, for an increase in release probability. And these are blocked by K252A, which is a track B, uh, uh, or track receptor uh, uh, signaling inhibitor, uh, anisomycin, and again, rapamycin. If you apply these agents just on their own, you don't see any effect. Okay, so this suggests that both in cultured neurons and in identified synapses in their native context, that mTOR uh, C1 signaling plays an important role in transsynaptic control of presynaptic function. And I should say that uh, this same role has been shown in Drosophila at the neuromuscular junction from Pegman Hajiji's lab. So it suggests that there's really wide evolutionary conservation of this mechanism, but also conservation across various synapse types, suggesting that this was really an important role uh, for mTOR signaling as a, as, a, as, a, as a signaling module at various synapse types. Okay, so does this change in BDNF synthesis, does this, is this actually necessary for the changes in plasticity? Um, so we could get at that using a combination of phosphatidic acid as a way to acutely activate mTOR signaling, and also using um, some uh, 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 RNAi approaches to, to, and rapid transfection approaches to block BDNF synthesis. And so we took advantage of the fact that uh, we could acutely uh, uh, deliver siRNAs into neurons very quickly, and with the logic that this should block new BDNF synthesis, but not appreciably affect existing BDNF levels due to the various, you know, due to the delay and half-life of BDNF degradation. Okay, and so when we do this, when we look at, at control siRNAs, we see a striking increase in BDNF expression with phosphatidic acid uh, administration. Um, and, but with the BDNF-specific siRNAs, we see that this increase is completely blocked, as we would expect. But importantly, um, this is not associated with a striking decrease in overall uh, uh, pre-existing BDNF levels. These are largely unaffected. So this gives us a tool to look at this newly synthesized pool um, of BDNF and ask whether it's necessary uh, for the changes to emerge, and in fact they are. So if we do the same approach and now look at these functional presynaptic changes, we see a striking increase with phosphatidic acid that is completely blocked um, when we block new BDNF synthesis with this RNAi approach. Okay, so together this suggests that new translation of BDNF downstream of mTOR plays a critical role in linking some aspect of postsynaptic signaling with regulation of presynaptic function. The big question is, what is this mechanism good for? Um, and so uh, we think that really where it probably is most important is in homeostatic regulation of synapse function, okay? And it's been known um, for a number of years that uh, uh, neurons will uh, uh, acutely have, have um, mechanisms that promote stabilization in, in both the neural circuits, but also at the level of individual synapses, okay? And so, um, uh, this is taking advantage of some, some prior work that we've done, where if you model uh, uh, how individual synapses get deprived of activity, in this case, one synapse over another, right, you could imagine that you could get, get compensation at the level of the postsynaptic function, where you'd see increases in the amplitude of these currents, or at the level of presynaptic function, where you'd see an increase in the frequency of these currents. And in fact, you see with, with an amper receptor block, or CNQX, when you put it on and then wash it off, uh, you see actually both sets of changes. You see an increase in the size of these events, which indicates a change in postsynaptic function, but you also see an increase in their frequency. Okay? Interestingly, if you do the same experiment but apply trototoxin to just block spiking activity, um, you see only the postsynaptic changes and not the presynaptic changes. Um, so it's suggesting that these presynaptic changes are somewhat state dependent. They require coincident activity um, in the presynaptic terminal. Okay, and I won't get into all that. Um, I'm going to summarize a lot of work here with just a cartoon. Um, we were able to determine that local translation actually underlies both of these effects. In this case, local translation of BDNF um, plays a major role in, in, in the presynaptic changes, whereas local translation of uh, uh, GLUA1 uh, subunit of amper receptors uh, favors the formation of homomeric receptors, which then 
is, a, is an, an important mechanism contributing to the uh, postsynaptic compensation. I won't have much more to say about this. Um, we've done a lot of work on it, but I, I'm going to focus mostly on the presynaptic changes for this talk. Um, and there's a few uh, of our papers that have established these, these changes. Okay, so this suggested then that does the mTOR signaling play a role in either of these processes? On the one hand, mTOR is known to play an important postsynaptic role. So you can imagine it might be important for the postsynaptic compensation. On the other hand, uh, we've just seen that activation of mTOR can actually drive a presynaptic mechanism which favors release. Um, the problem is, is that mTOR is, uh, under most conditions, it's driven not by inactivity, but by patterned synaptic activity. So we know that when you drive activity, that's, that's a good stimulus to get mTOR activation. Um, does it actually respond to inactivity? Um, and it turns out that it does. So in this case, we've uh, applied amper receptor antagonists to remove synaptic activity. And we found that this actually does activate mTOR signaling, again, indicated by phospho-S6 aminocytic chemistry here. We see this both in the dendrites and the somatic compartments. Um, and if you do Western blots, it gives the whole variety of, um, of different downstream TOR C1 effectors. You see uh, activation of each of these, including, again, phospho-S6, uh, this uh, mTOR selective site on P70S6 kinase, as well as on 4 bp one all mTOR selective sites. Okay, so, so Amper receptor blockade, removing synaptic inactivity, drives mTOR signaling. Um, and in fact, when we look at blocking mTOR function during amper receptor blockade, we see that it's selectively required for the presynaptic changes, so presynaptic changes without altering the postsynaptic changes. So we see this increase in mini amplitude. This is largely spared, or this is completely spared by rapamycin, the mTOR C1 inhibitor, as well as C401, which is an active site mTOR inhibitor. But these effects, but these, both of these drugs completely suppress the presynaptic changes. Okay, so uh, alluding to, to Michael's question, um, this is great, but are these mechanisms in fact localized? Um, are they under local control? Um, and so to get at this question, we wanted to locally manipulate TOR C1 signaling, uh, but then we needed a way to optically read out presynaptic function. And so one of the approaches we took was to use an antibody labeling assay, where we have an antibody that's, that uh, specific for the luminal domain of synaptotagmin 1, okay? And so the only way to get labeling of this antibody is if a synaptic vesicle, it, synaptic vesicle's interior is exposed to the extracellular space if you do this labeling live, right? So this basically labels uh, synaptic vesicles as they exocytose. And so by using a fairly brief labeling period um, in the presence of uh, TTX, so you can look at spontaneous vesicle fusion, you can uh, basically record the number of synaptic terminals that have released one or more vesicles over this brief five to ten minute period, okay? Um, so this gives us a, a way to look at, at presynaptic activity, and we can look at a structural marker, the actual vesicular glutamate transporter, um, as a sort of an overall structural marker of synapses. So when you do this, um, and what we did in this experiment was we, we use a dual micro pipette perfusion system to locally deliver rapamycin um, to this region of dendrite here. Um, and you can see it here in the, in the, and then we did live alpha synaptotagmin la labeling against the luminal domain. Um, you can see the perfusion area here. It's probably evident even in this image that uh, the amount of vesicles released in this target area were, is lower than you can see in the, in the surrounding areas where mTOR, uh, where mTOR signaling was not inhibited. And here's just a blow up here. Um, you don't see the same changes in, in dglut one And if you quantify this, this behavior, you see that in the perfusion spot itself, we see a selective inhibition of this presynaptic compensation induced by BAF amper receptor blockade um, without changes in, in VGLUT1 expression. And you don't see this effect if you, if you basically leave out the amper receptor antagonist. If you just locally block mTOR signaling, this doesn't really affect, um, which is shown here, this doesn't really affect um, uh, overall presynaptic function. Okay. Um, so together, this suggests that mTOR signaling is contributing to this limb of the pathway, that it's involved in, in protein synthetic control um, uh, of BDNF and its local release and uh, uh, regulation of presynaptic function. Okay, um, but we're still left with this problem, and that is we know that mTOR contributes to regulation of postsynaptic function when it's driven um, by synaptic activity even if we're driving mTOR through some other mechanism, um, why, are, why are the changes that we're seeing so restricted to the presynaptic compartment? Okay. Is, there, is there a novel mechanism 
whereby mTOR is engaged by inactivity? Okay, and it turns out the answer to that question is yes. Um, so my lab has an interest in lipid signaling, um, and so we've used various probes to look at very, uh, different phosphonostide species. Um, and so by accident, we were looking at phosphatidic acid regulation, and this, we used a reporter, um, uh, which uses SPO20, um, the phosphatidic acid binding domain of SPO20 fused to GFP, which is then um, has an NLS associated with it. So all this reporter goes to the nucleus, it sort of slowly leaks out in the cytoplasm, and you can measure phosphatidic acid synthesis by virtue of clustering of this normally diffuse GFP. Okay, so when you, when you use this reporter and then apply amperoceptor blockers, you see a rapid and dramatic increase in phosphatidic acid synthesis, particularly in the dendrites. Um, but you do see this in the cell body as well. It's tougher to see using this probe. But in other probes, we used here a RAF1 phosphatidic acid binding domain. Um, you see the same basic effect. You see an, uh, an increase with, with amperoceptor blockade. But curiously, you don't see any changes associated with an LTP-inducing stimulus. So this is using a glycine protocol that we know drives long-term potentiation at these synapses, and, but we don't see any changes in phosphatidic acid synthesis associated with it, okay? And these changes in phosph phosphatidic acid synthesis or clustering can be largely blocked by an inhibitor of phospholipase D. And that's important because there are several routes to phosphatidic acid synthesis in neurons, but hydrolysis of phosphatidylcholine by phospholipase D is probably the primary route. And the fact that a PLD inhibitor, a small molecule PLD inhibitor, blocks these changes suggested that PLD signaling might actually contribute. Oops. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, and so uh, to ask this question, we asked whether mTOR uh, activation in response to these two patterns of stimulation is, differs. And in response to chemical LTP stimulation, we see that robust mTOR activation, as we would expect, and this is, lar this is largely unaffected by PLD inhibition with BP. Um, but the mTOR activation we see with amperoceptor blockade is completely suppressed. Okay, so this suggests this is the divergence point then where PLD signaling is important for um, uh, uh, mTOR activation, but only in response to synaptic inactivity, not in response to coordinated synaptic activity. Okay. Um, so we're interested in, uh, there's actually two PLD isoforms in mammals, PLD1 and PLD2. Uh, we were interested in these differ both in their sort of uh, uh, overall cellular localization and their function. They're generally non-redundant with each other. Uh, so we wanted to know which of these two uh, uh, isoforms was important. So we, we expressed these in, in neurons and asked which was capable of driving TOR signaling. We found actually that PLD1 effectively drove TOR C1 signaling uh, in neurons, but PLD2 did not. Um, Likewise, um, if we look at this phosphorylated S6 on a sort of spatial scale, you see that there are hot spots of mTOR signaling, and these largely coincide with the hot spots of PLD1 expression, suggesting a, a relationship between localization of PLD1 and mTOR activation. And finally, when we look at phosphatidic acid synthesis, we see um, this also, um, uh, these hot spots of phosphatidic acid synthesis also generally co localize with sites of PLD1 accumulation. Again, suggesting that PLD1 through synthesis of phosphatidic acid is what's the main pathway driving this mTOR C1 signaling, but only in response to synaptic inactivity, not in response to Hebbian or type uh, activation. Okay, um, and it turns out that uh, we see the same effects when we look at the, when we look at the function of these synapses. So, um, when we express H, uh, when we express PLD1, um, we see uh, uh, no real change in postsynaptic function, but we see a striking increase in the frequency of these events, indicating a change in presynaptic function. And again, PLD2 expression does not recapitulate these effects. And likewise, we see that PLD1 expression, but not PLD2, drives increases in dendritic BDNF expression. And again, here's the interesting thing: again, we see a very selective increase in the dendritic compartment without corresponding changes in, um, in the somatic compartment, which is coincidentally a phenotype that we also see with amper receptor blockade. Okay, so there's, there's something about mTOR signaling, even though it's cell wide, that specifically drives BDNF synthesis in the dendritic compartment. All right, um, and so finally, just to sort of round this story out, we wanted to, to ask, so is mTOR signaling in fact differentially dependent on phosphatidic acid synthesis 
in these two paradigms, in, in response to chemical LTP or in response to synaptic inactivity. Uh, and so to do this, we, we used a, an approach, we used rapamycin-resistant mTOR mutants. This allowed us to sort of BAP apply rapamycin, take out mTOR signaling everywhere in the network, and restore it in individual neurons by virtue of expressing these rapamycin-resistant mutants. So we used a, a, a single mutant that's rapamycin-resistant, as well as a, a, a mutant that had a, a second mutation that rendered the mTOR insensitive to phosphatidic acid binding, okay? So if we look at just the first mutant, um, the rapamycin-resistant mutant, we see um, uh, that this rescues mTOR signaling in response both to chemical LTP uh, as well as to amper receptor blockade. However, the phosphatidic acid-resistant mutant, although it rescues mTOR signaling in response to LTP, it, uh, mTOR signaling driven by uh, synaptic inactivity is completely blocked, okay? So again, this, this is a, a point of, of divergence between Hebbian plasticity and, and these homeostatic mechanisms. And likewise, we see the same changes at the level of synaptic function where um, the, the phosphatidic acid mutant, um, the phosphatidic acid specific mutant uh, uh, is selectively blocks uh, uh, presynaptic changes induced by amper receptor blockade, but does not block synaptic changes induced by chemical LTP stimulation as shown here. Okay, so together, what does this suggest? Okay, it suggests that um, that synaptic inactivity has sort of a unique pathway to mTOR activation. There's sort of a specialized homeostatic signaling pathway that links uh, changes in amper receptor function to mTOR signaling under uh, conditions where these receptors are not being optimally activated. This PLD signaling uh, drives synthesis of phosphatidic acid, which in turn drives mTOR signaling the, and uh, the BDNF-induced transsynaptic control of presynaptic function. Okay. What's particularly interesting about this mechanism, I think, is that this is driven, um, is that when, when activity at these receptors is suboptimal, this of course will drive this pathway, which culminates in release of more neurotransmitter. Okay. But when that release of neurotransmitter brings these two compartments back into functional alignment, this pathway of course will be, will, will be shut off. And so this provides sort of a nice negative feedback control pathway whereby uh, the postsynaptic neuron can control presynaptic release almost like a rheostat. You can, you can, mon you can alter uh, release up until the point where it's optimal and then the pathway shuts off. Okay? So this is important, we think an important homeostatic signaling uh, pathway that coordinates pre and postsynaptic function. Yeah, Mike. So you're, uh, you're calling presynaptic function <coughs> Yeah. That's an excellent question. Um, excellent question. And in fact, um, I did, I, I took all the data out of the talk, but we in fact have got lots of evidence that links these voltage gated calcium channels, PQ and N type calcium channels, which are the, the, the calcium channels at terminals that, that couple calcium influx to release. Um, I haven't gone into that. And in fact, this, this coincidence detection mechanism is, is critically important. Um, and I'm going to get to why that's important in just a second. It's not like the heavy and coincidence detection mechanism on the order of milliseconds. Um, recent activity is sufficient um, to allow this BDF signaling to drive release. But if these synapses are not, haven't been recently active, this BDNF signaling doesn't work. So this is what's, that's another layer, layer of regulatory control that sort of confines this homeostatic signaling pathway to release events that have been action potential driven versus spontaneously released. Okay. Um, so the question now is, what changes occur in the presynaptic? Yeah, Michael. So, so for this kind of closed loop circuit to work, you have to say a local signal, BDNF to be released, whether it's JP fine or even by other cells. How do, how do you think the relationship is defined to do that? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Um, uh, the specificity in part is, is controlled by um, uh, the, the co-requirement for activity. So it's, it's so BDF's only going to target those synapses that were recently active, as those synapses where the signal was, was deemed insufficient, right? Um, uh, yeah, so outside of that, I mean, there, there could be a whole host of other mechanisms that, that, that uh, contribute to spatial specificity. Um, so, but we think this is actually a very, 
important, at least first stab at looking at, you know, what class of mechanism actually underlies this functional stabilization uh, and use this sort of as a blueprint to go after other mechanisms. And we can I'll talk about that at the end of the talk. Okay? Okay. So I want to remind you um, that these presynaptic changes are heavily state dependent. Okay? That means that um, if the presynaptic terminals are not active, you don't see any compensatory increases in presynaptic function. So if we block AMP receptors with CNQX, we see a, a nice increase in uh, VGLUT4 and release. So in this case, we, we're, we're driving a train of action potentials, monitoring synaptic vessel, vesicle exocytosis with VGLUT4. We see a nice increase in release in, with, in cells that have been exposed to AMP receptor blockade versus control. But if you apply TTX during the AMP receptor blockade, these changes are completely gone, okay? So you need coactivity of pre, presynaptic elements at the same time. Um, and it turns out that uh, uh, these presynaptic mechanisms seem to be uh, uh, critically dependent on the ubiquitin proteasome system. Because if you block, uh, if you use inhibitors of the UPS, so lactocystin or MG132, you block either the electrophysiological signatures of these presynaptic changes um, or the uh, 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 imaging signatures, the synaptic vesicle exocytosis. And importantly, these changes, these effects don't affect the postsynaptic changes. So this seems to be somewhat selective for presynaptic compensation. So to ask which compartment the proteasome might operate in, um, we took advantage of a, of a, a chain elongation mutant of ubiquitin, K4-8R. Um, so this is a lysine to arginine mutation. So as you probably know, uh, uh, lysine 48 chains are one of the major signals for targeted degradation of proteins by, by the proteasome. So this blocks uh, chain growth, but doesn't block monoubiquitination. So it spares a lot of the ubiquitin-dependent signaling, but does block ubiquitin-dependent degradation by the proteasome. So when we express this in the postsynaptic compartment and then add amper receptor blockers, we see that this doesn't really affect the increase in presynaptic function we normally see. But if we express this in the presynaptic compartment and then monitor release driven by amper receptor blockade, we see that this largely blocks the compensatory increase in presynaptic function. So again, this suggests that the proteasome, even though it's, it's serving a sort of coordinated role with translation, it's actually operating in a distinct cellular compartment in the presynaptic compartment, okay? Which allowed us, which prompted us to ask, what do the proteasomes look like in axons? And uh, uh, what's amazing about the somatodendritic and axonal distribution of proteasomes is that they're very abundant in the cell body, pretty abundant in dendrites, but very, very scarce in axons. Um, so much so that it's actually very difficult to visualize them using traditional antibody-based uh, detection. So our approach was to express recombinant uh, epitope tagged versions of proteasome subunits so we could monitor uh, uh, movement of proteasomes in various compartments based on these more high-efficiency uh, imaging uh, approaches. And what we found is that, uh, and so in this case, we actually flag-tagged RPT3, which is a component of the 19S proteasome. And we found that under control conditions, we in axons, um, it was found both in synaptic and extrasynaptic sites. The synaptic sites were labeled by co-expression of m cherry synaptophysin, and we saw it both at these puncta, but also in, in the shafts between these puncta. What was interesting is that when we drove activity of these cells using vicuculin, we saw a dramatic distribution of the proteasome towards synaptic sites and away from extrasynaptic sites. And we saw the opposite effect when we applied TTX, a movement away from synaptic sites towards extrasynaptic regions, and that's quantified here. We saw the same effect in live imaging experiments, so we swapped out um, the proteasome subunit. We used RPT6 in this case, and we used the GFP tagged version. And again, we can see it at, at and we monitor its, its uh, dynamic behavior at synaptic and extrasynaptic sites and axons. And when we, when we uh, remove activity with retrototoxin, we see an, a decrease in the synaptic localization um, of, uh, of, uh, of RPT6. Um, commensurate with an increase in the extrasynaptic localization, indicating that it's actually moving from, from synaptic sites to extrasynaptic regions. And if you directly depolarize the, uh, uh, the, the terminals using a high potassium solution, you can rapidly reverse this effect and again drive the proteasome back towards synaptic sites. Okay? Um, so this suggested to us that there was an sort of interesting redistribution of the proteasome in response to activity. And so to look at this further, we um, uh, swapped out GFP for photoactivatable GFP so we could label proteasomes in distinct cellular compartments and ask whether their behavior was different in either synaptic or extrasynaptic regions. And we found actually that when we photoactivated 
uh, this is RP, this is photo act, uh, this is PAGFP tagged RPT6 in this case. When we photoactivated in, in the shaft between synapses, we saw rapid dispersion of proteasomes away from that site, um, suggesting again that they're highly dynamic and highly mobile in axons. Uh, but curiously, when they encountered synaptic regions, their mobility slowed markedly down. Okay. Um, and so this is, these are the profiles of, of, of this experiment when, when the GFP signal hit, hit these uh, synaptic sites. And using targeted uh, photoactivation at synaptic terminals, we confirmed that, that the, the retention of the proteasome at synaptic terminals is markedly higher, so loss is markedly lower than it is in extrasynaptic regions, okay? Suggesting that, this, that the proteasome is stably associated with some element of the presynaptic terminal. We know actually that that's not just because terminals are sticky, because if you uh, use other photoactivated proteins and soluble GFP, you don't see those effects. So something about the specific interaction of uh, the proteasome with uh, some element of the synapse. And so using um, uh, a strategy where we, where we photoactivate at individual terminals, we can monitor uh, exit rates of, of the proteasome from those terminals by, so simply by the loss of GFP fluorescence. And what we found is that when we accelerated activity using bicuculane, we markedly in, uh, increased the longevity of proteasomes at these terminals, suggesting that activity was regulating the interaction of proteasomes uh, with, the synaptic, with, with the synaptic terminals and thereby increasing their abundance at synaptic terminals. Okay, so what kind of mechanisms might contribute to this? And it, it turns out that, um, that a lot of work is focused on phosphorylation of the proteasome uh, at, on RPT6 um, at a specific serine residue, serine 120. Um, so this has been shown to be regulated by activity and in certain circumstances has been shown to, to regulate dendritic localization of the proteasome. So we wanted to know whether S6 phosphorylation might play a role. And so we co-expressed, um, uh, uh, sorry, S6, uh, serine 120 phosphorylation might play a role. So we co-expressed wild type RPT6 or, or various uh, serine 120 mutants, either an alanine mutant to block phosphorylation or an aspartate mutant to mimic it, and we monitored exit rates of proteasomes from the, from the terminals. And what we found is that, um, here's the wild type version here, the alanine mutant where it can't be phosphorylated markedly uh, increased exit rate from presynaptic terminals where the aspartate mutant that mimics phosphorylation slowed it, okay? Suggesting that these changes are at least in part controlled by serine-120 phosphorylation. Um, and so uh, uh, if that's true, then do these, if you express these different subunits, does that affect steady state localization of the proteasome? And in fact, it does. So um, serine-120 mutant, much like what we see with TTX treatment, is largely excluded from synaptic sites, whereas a serine-120 mutant is, is, has a pronounced synaptic localization and resembles what we see under activity stimulation conditions. Okay, so if this is true then, um, does serine-120 phosphorylation and its, and, it, and its manipulation actually contribute to the activity-dependent redistribution of the proteasome, okay? And so in this case, we use the alanine mutant that can't be phosphorylated and asked whether it affects the normal increase in synaptic localization we see with bicuculin. And so in wild type, with the wild type version, we see marked increases in, in synaptic proteasome accumulation, um, but this is completely gone in the serine 120 mutant. And this gave us, gave us the opportunity to ask, does this proteasome redistribution in fact matter for the compensation that we see downstream of amper receptor blockade and mTOR. Um, so we use the same, we express these same uh, constructs, the serine 120 or wild type mutant, blocked amper receptors with CNQX, and then monitored compensatory changes in presynaptic function using deglute fluorine imaging. What we found is that um, when we, normally when we, we uh, after amper receptor blockade, we see a nice increase in, in, in release, as indicated by deglute fluorine. Um, this is inhibited, not completely blocked, but is still significantly inhibited by expression of serine 120 alanine mutant, suggesting that proteasome trafficking to synapses plays an important role in gating this transsynaptic control downstream of amper receptor blockade. So we can ask the same sort of question, but now asking whether, whether the phosphomimetic version, um, which normally traffics constitutively to synaptic terminals in the absence of activity, a fact that we confirmed here, so TTX normally uh, uh, removes proteasomes from synaptic terminals, but it's completely ineffective in the 120 uh, D mutant. Um, so this allowed us to ask, is the requirement for presynaptic activity, in fact, due to this proteasome relocalization, um, at least in part? And so we can ask, 
now that we can, we can express the serine 120 uh, aspartate mutant, which traffics the synapses even in the absence of activity, and ask, is these, are these presynaptic changes still state dependent? And the answer um, is no. So if we block amper receptors with, under, with, with the wild type uh, control, we see um, one level change, and that's completely unaffected um, by TTX when we express uh, the serine 120 the serine 120 aspartate mutant. So, so mimicking serine 120 phosphorylation basically rescues this, uh, uh, this presynaptic compensation from state dependent gating, suggesting that the requirement for coincident activity is in fact at least partly um, uh, uh, reflects dynamic distribution of the proteasome in axons. Okay, so I know I've told you a lot today. Let me just sort of uh, do my best to summarize it. So I started by telling you that uh, mTOR complex one signaling in dendrites plays uh, an important role in controlling postsynaptic function, yes, but also plays a very unique role, we think, in, in transsynaptic control of presynaptic neurotransmitter release. So we know that this is at least in part due to local translation of BDNF in dendrites, which is released and acts on presynaptic tract B receptors to um, drive increases in release. Um, I also told you that this homeostatic role for mTOR signaling uh, uh, is uh, mediated by a unique signaling pathway that's not shared with other forms of plasticity like LTP. This involves phospholipase deactivation, uh, uh, hydrolysis of phosphatidylcholine, and activation of phosphatic acid, which then binds and activates mTOR C1 uh, and drives this, this, the rest of this pathway. And that activity plays a major role in shaping these processes, uh, and through data I haven't really talked about today, um, through, uh, uh, we know that at least part of this is through influx of calcium through PQ and N-type channels. And this sort of recent history of activity is required specifically due to phosphorylation of the proteasome, which allows it to be retained at synaptic terminals in sufficient numbers to interact with TRAC-B signaling and degrade some critical protein. Um, I'm not gonna go into any data today, but it turns out one of these proteins we think is a protein Thomason. This is the negative regulator of presynaptic release. And we have uh, uh, data now that shows that Thomason degradation uh, mimics a lot of these uh, uh, effects of mTOR activation and amper receptor blockade in driving uh, presynaptic release. Um, and in fact, Thomason is degraded in presynaptic terminals downstream of both amper receptor blockade and acute elevations of mTOR signaling. Okay. Uh, we've been able to identify an E3 ligase, HRD1, which specifically uh, regulates the vigorination of Thomason. I won't, uh, obviously I didn't talk about that, but this is just how we're thinking about it. Um, and we think that this in part contributes um, uh, through Thomason degradation by the proteasome uh, in sort of ultimately leading to these increases in presynaptic function. It's likely that there are other proteins involved, but, but uh, Thomason seems to be at least a major player in this. Um, uh, we, you know, we think this is actually a very important mechanism, not only for controlling synaptic function, but for maintaining coordinated output between presynaptic terminals and their postsynaptic uh, uh, postsynaptic targets. And this is, you know, regardless of how of whether this is one of several mechanisms, this is actually a very important area in synaptic biology that we've sort of largely ignored. You know, what are the sort of uh, the crosstalk mechanisms that allow this very precise alignment to persist, even in the face of dynamic receptor trafficking, dynamic changes in vesicle release, and in the face of plasticity. So we think this is probably one of, of several mechanisms that participate. And in fact, um, I would predict that there is at least one other mechanism, one that can re read out where presynaptic release is, is over excessive. Um, in fact, Yukiko Godis lab has shown that when presynaptic release is, is excessive, this drives homeostatic uh, uh, changes uh, that, that then turn, um, uh, that then culminate back in compensation and down, down, uh, uh, down regulating that release. But of course, we don't know what the mechanisms are. So this suggests at least one other mechanism that does the opposite side of this and possibly a whole family of other mechanisms as well. So with that, uh, let me just uh, thank the folks that did the work. <coughs> I talked a lot about Trace Henry's work, who was a former postdoc in the lab. He's now at Scott Sternson's lab at, uh, at Genelia. Um, and Christian Altos, uh, who's a, a senior fellow in the lab, has also done uh, a lot of this prism trafficking work. Okay, so with that, uh, I'd be delighted to take questions and thank you all for your attention.
Yes, in the back. Yeah, um, let me process that. So uh, I would say first, yes, we did consider other uh, retrograde messengers and are still considering other retrograde messengers. Uh, we formally tested a few of them, nitric oxide, uh, a few others. Um, but of course, that, that has not been an exhaustive determination. Um, I would imagine that there would be a whole host of target-derived retrograde messengers that, that you know, possibly needs some functional redundancy with BDNF. Um, uh, or possibly mediate some unique effects. For example, in down-regulating neurotransmitter release when these receptors are being excessively driven. Um, uh, as, to, uh, as to your question about whether postsynaptic tract B receptors are contributing, um, that is actually a formal possibility. Um, so we've done a, a number of experiments where we have uh, blocked tract B function uh, using local perfusion. We have never done the experiment you suggested, um, which is to specifically take out track B receptors in the presynaptic terminal. So we have not done that experiment. And for the reasons you suggested, it would be a good one to do. Um, we have, you know, we've done a lot of experiments looking at blocking local release. So if we locally perfuse track BFC, we can prevent these changes. Um, so but it is possible that that is blocking some autocrine function of BDNF, which in turn is driving something else. That, that's possible. So, good point. So, during, you mean during the, the chemical LTP stimulation? Yeah, so I mean, uh, uh, there's a number of signaling pathways that drive that. RAS, uh, ERK has been uh, suggested as a regulator. Most of them signal either through the TSC family of proteins, tuberosclerosis proteins, or through PI3 MAP kinase to get to TOR signaling. They're fairly well established signaling pathways. I think what's sort of unique about you know, synaptic inactivity is that it bypasses those pathways and actually seems to engage a novel pathway that seems more specialized for homeostatic, link, linking homeostatic signals to TOR signaling. Uh, that's, that's a tough question to answer. So, uh, so mTOR signaling is dynamic. Um, it often, so during seizures, uh, at least some seizures, mTOR signaling is, is, has been profoundly upregulated. Uh, that's been shown uh, uh, by a variety of labs. Uh, and if you manipulate TOR signaling, uh, you, and you enhance TOR signaling, you can predispose circuits to seizure. Um, but over time, uh, yeah, the, then those same signaling pathways do dampen down uh, and, uh, and are subject to, you know, downregulation. I don't know the exact timing of TOR uh, downregulation in epilepsy models, and I, I imagine it differs probably substantially across different epilepsy models. Um, Right. So my question about the proteasome kind of stalling in the uh, presynaptic and so forth is to what degree is that related to whether there's a postsynaptic spine versus a staff contact, if you have any data like that? Yeah. Um, and, and, and really, I, and to what degree is that regulation? It comes back to that first issue about localization of the signal right there, I guess. Um, could there be effects on the detons that are, that are making non-spinous contact maybe in the neighborhood? Right. So, um, 
It's a great question, actually. Uh, it's hard to answer for us because, you know, I would say 98% of our excitatory synapses are made on the spines. Um, uh, of the ones that are not, uh, they're all made on the soma, uh, which we generally ignore because these neurons don't generally get somatic excitatory input. Um, but I think it is an interesting question. Uh, and that is, is, the, is the sort of nature of a spine uh, and the compartmentalized nature in particular of it, is that actually a requirement for this plasticity? And I would hazard a guess probably it is, that at least some level of organization where, uh, that confines these signaling networks in space uh, is going to be required. We know that in, 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 uh, in both cultured neurons and in slices, in acute slices, that spine formation is, is correlates with the emergence of these changes. So before spines form, these changes, these compensatory changes don't manifest. After spines form, they do. Is there a functional relationship to, between the two? We actually don't know. But I would suspect that there probably is. So it's, there, there are, uh, so it's, polyribosomes are actually fairly widespread in dendrites. Um, this, this picture that I love from Ozzy um, uh, is great because it shows them exactly where you'd expect them to be, right at the base of a spine, sort of integrating the sort of synaptic environment um, and making the decision to translate proteins. Uh, uh, but in fact, there, you, you often see polyribosomes in the heads of spines, you see them in the shafts between spines. Um, they, are, they are predominantly synaptically localized, but they're not exclusively synaptically localized. And Aussie's even commented on several occasions that there may be polyribosomes in the, in the PSD itself. And in fact, you see lots of, of ribosomal proteins in proteomic studies of the PSD. So it's possible that, you know, that you, what you can't see because of the sort of elect, uh, the, the fuzz uh, is actually hiding a, a whole set of new, new, new polyribosomes. So I imagine that they would be uh, fairly heterotypically expressed in, in dendrites. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, like, is there a sort of a priming effect and a history effect? And that's, and so we don't know, um, but I think that that actually is a very interesting uh, idea, interesting uh, question. Um, uh, yeah, so um, the mechanisms we're still trying to understand, uh, first of all, you know, what the dynamics are. So what is the window between driving activity, a series of action potentials, and the window where proteasomes are more likely to persist? Okay, so work I haven't talked about, we think that this interaction is mediated by interactions with the actin cytoskeleton. Uh, and we know that, the, that, that serine 120 phosphorylation very potently regulates you know, actin affinity. Um, uh, but um, and the question is we really don't know how, you know, what the window is from, from action potentials to increased actin affinity, how long it is. It, it, as I said, it isn't on the order of milliseconds like heavy in plasticity. It's more on the order of you know, many seconds to you know, a couple minutes. Um, uh, and a couple minutes would be, would be on the very long end, I would think. Um, so we haven't measured it. Um, that's something we've, that we, we would like to do, um, but just haven't uh, uh, had the opportunity right now to sort of systematically measure that window. Um, and that, I think if we did have that window, we would be able to address the very question you suggest, which I think is a very interesting one, right? You know, is there, so yes, activity drives these things, but is there sort of an imprint of prior activity based on either the phosphorylation status of serine 120 or some other uh, post-translational event that then enables these proteasomes to traffic you know, more easily to spines or inhibits their trafficking, uh, sorry, to, to terminals, or inhibits their trafficking. That's actually a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a good question. Um, so uh, we don't know why they leave. Um, it may just be um, 
And in fact, you know, if I were to design the axon, I would just put all the proteasomes at terminals, make them completely non-dynamic. Uh, I know we wouldn't have any of these problems and you know, we wouldn't be able to publish this paper, of course, but um, you wouldn't need this problem. Um, so there must be some, uh, 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 there must be some uh, reasoning behind it. And so one possibility is that, and I mentioned before that proteasomes are actually very scarce at axons generally. Um, you see them as compared to the somatic and the, and the dendritic compartments. Uh, so dendritic trafficking of proteasomes has been talked about, but the, there's so many of them there, do you really need to share them between synapses? I mean, it seems like there's so many proteasomes, you can degrade uh, you know, every protein in the you know, BSD a couple times over. That's, that's being a little bit exaggerating. But, uh, whereas in axons, they're much more scarce. And so maybe you need this mobility in part because you have so many terminals you need, you don't have enough proteasomes to, to meet all of the degradation demands um, at any one point in time, so they're mobile. And so, so recently active neurons can capture them and gives them a window of opportunity to sort of you know, change their function and then that window of opportunity declines when they leave. You know, that, uh, that's one possibility. Um, uh, uh, best possibility that we can think of. We think that there's some advantage to the mobility because they're scarce, and, and though the scarcity of the proteasomes allows this sort of sharing um, uh, and allows activity to sort of run the show in terms of which terminals are gonna be, um, are gonna benefit uh, from, uh, from uh, acquiring proteasomes. We have not measured. Um, uh, we have not measured precisely the interval between the end of a series of action potentials and how long uh, the persistence changes. And the main reason for that is that um, you know, if you want to be precise, you need to, to 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 measure rates at various times following a series of action potentials, and then compare those rates. So it's actually a fairly complicated experiment. Uh, um, to run. One that should be done, but one that we haven't had a chance to do yet. Yes, yeah, so that's a thing. I should have, I don't think I explicitly said that, but I, I meant to explicitly imply it. All of this work has actually been done in excitatory synapses. And, and um, uh, a big question is, you know, to what extent do these same mechanisms apply at inhibitory synapses. We know at least with the mTOR signaling that we don't see any major changes in inhibitory synaptic function, either postsynaptic function or release when we acutely drive TOR signaling. Um, now, it's sure gonna change if you maintain that dysregulated signaling for a long enough period of time. That's been reported by Bernardo Sabatini and, and, and others, um, but it's, it's not, it doesn't acutely manifest with a very short activation. Um, so uh, that's why we have focused largely on the excitatory synapses in this case. All right, thank you. Thank you.